welcome back uh, to Fighting Fukuyama, where I argue with Fukuyama and liberalism in general. Um, specifically, this time I want to pick up on actually something Fuku is, which is very much one of Fukuyama's talking points, which is the liberal societies are rule of law societies. And that um, this is what gives them a certain... Uh, let's say force of justice and legitimacy which which is why they've prospered um historically over other societies um i don't want to say that this is untrue historically i think there it probably is actually a rule of law a, let's say a kind of conviction towards a certain understanding of justice not just abstractly but kind of concretely in in processes and how we process uh you know opposing interests to each other how we how we process um different impulses in human nature for example cruelty um a society that will kind of arbitrarily kill people or 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 lock them up or take away their property um is fundamentally bad and that we need to have a process to stop that even from happening um, within you know the major power players of a society and so on and those power players have to in order in order to be truly elite they have to sort of expose themselves to a process of justice which in which in which they can't just arbitrarily do whatever they want whenever they want to they can pursue certain their own interests in, in 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 um in some way or another but 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 that pursuit has to be kind of formed under certain codes of conduct we could say now there's nothing well every, everything i've just said by the way isn't exclusive to liberalism H human beings you, you could find examples of this throughout all of human history to some degree or another um i think it's a myth that often modern societies like to create, that all other societies, all previous historical societies, medieval societies, antiquity, classical societies, and so on and so forth, just acted in this sort of, um, um, uh, acted in a way which was immediately satisfying towards their own interest and towards their own power, um, if they had the power or, or status or authority to do so. This is a sort of progressive mythology, which is completely nonsense. But nonetheless, if we if we just take the modern world into account, it does seem the liberalism for a period of time managed to somehow entrench an un within its own civilizations an understanding of what we could call a kind of noble or just conduct um, relating to, for example, innocent till proven guilty. For example, um, term limits within governments, which aren't necessarily good, but they do at least um, exemplify some sort of ethic of um, temporal limitations on power, um, uh, which itself implies that power has to be justified in some sense. So anyway, the point is, Liberalism has, I think, managed to to uh, create something historically which was which which worked in this regard. Um, the question now is whether or not it can continue to provide that, um, and whether or not other systems could not provide that. So I think that we could say that it would be, you know, the kind of Duganistic. Um, uh, I suppose the you know uh, a kind of liberal realism to assume that to assume that no other system political system could ever be created that could provide some sort of rule of law. Um, I think this is probably untrue that that something could be created. After all, liberalism was created, so why couldn't something else be created? Um, but the main thing I want to go over in this video is actually to to try argue this this the um, capacity for liberalism to hold on to whatever 
uh, kind of conviction towards justice and process, uh, rule of law, uh, the, 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 its capacity to hold on to to, to that conviction um, is basically gone already. I would say it's basically already gone. It's not completely gone, but it's 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 it's. I think it's fundamentally already gone, but it's just the institutions and structures and legal systems and blah, 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 blah. All this stuff takes a long time to to change and adapt and so on. But like the, it, to speak in sort of Hegelian terms, the kind of spirit, the, 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 not just the systems and, and, the, and, and, and the legalities, but the, but the fundamental spirit of a time, I think in, so insofar as liberalism, is fundamentally without that, without that conviction towards justice. And now the question is why and what happened. Uh, you know, people offer lots of lots of different various uh, narratives. Conservatives will say it happened in the '60s with this and the, with neo-Marxism and postmodernism. Um, uh, maybe Marxists will say it's happened because of a a, um, uh, a, a in, an unchecked. Uh, unchecked power of capitalism and so on it's probably some truth to both of these statements but i actually think that fundamentally what it comes down to is um liberalism's understanding of tolerance was sort of set to fail from the very beginning um uh, why is another complicated story to do with hobbes and locke and how the contractual uh, c- contractual philosophies and c- contractual moralities and so on were um, uh, like their fundamental um, errors, we could say. But I, I don't want to get into that here. Um, it, it, I just want to point out that it, it is within the realm of tolerance, ironically enough, in which, in which, um, um, uh, the capacity for justice or, or due process or, or rule of law is uh, uh, no longer possible. And I'm going to, as I normally do, I'm going to try understand this in psychopolitical terms. So basically not, not necessarily in like political scientific terms, but like psychopolitical terms. And so tolerance is... Um, a dem- tolerance is fundamentally on a kind of psychological level. I'm, I'm speaking somewhat here in the language of the um, of the sociologist Norbert Elias, uh, who wrote the Civilizing Process, which I'm, I'm about two thirds of the way through now, and it's a fantastic book, and it deals a lot with it, with um, how feelings of uh, aggression, in particular, are managed um, within. A civilizing process and the civilizing process which he's discussing here is the western one which emerged um in the kind of late medieval to the early modern period and then continued on to to uh i think it peaked i think he thinks around the 19th century and we still live within that it's just we live in a very weird variation of it or a very weird stage of it but basically the, the liberal and enlightened um, um uh, western uh, realm and he talks about an affect molding so we have a sort of what we would call um uh, maybe in more common vernacular you might call character building the character of, of of a people but it it fundamentally means the you know the internalization to use psychoanalytical terms the internalization of a certain of a certain of a certain conduct of social relations and and what we might call an ideal form of being not just materially you know how much wealth you create or something like that or not just uh biologically but kind of psychosocially psychosocially like the ideal state to be in how you should conduct yourself um in society in civilization and not just as a false appearance, but like it's it's it is caught up into a false appearance. But this false appearance is internalized 
so deeply that it's not experienced just as a false appearance. It's experienced as a kind of complete necessity. Um, okay, the word superego we could think of here too and so on. I, I, you know, these are terms which maybe people will debate over, so let's not get stuck into, into terms. But um, something like an internalized norm, an internalized moral structure, which is viscerally deep within um, a civilization and reproduces itself through its structures, its education, its, its, its morals, its laws, and so on and so forth. And I think it's fair to say that tolerance is maybe the civilizing, at least for the Western liberal civilizing process, it has been perhaps the uh, may, the most significant influence. And it's important to note that tolerance is something which we could put as opposed to um, aggression, self-assertion. Uh, violent and indignant impulses. It's also important to note that the most popular psychologist of our time, Jordan Peterson, the most like well-known, influential psychologist, is basically a he's basically an assertion trainer, and he he, he says this himself. He says that. Um, after anxiety, the most common thing that, that modern psychologists treat is um, assertion problems. People can't assert themselves. And like, what does that mean? People can't assert themselves. Well, it means they're too tolerant. It means they're too agreeable and so on. Um, and uh, uh, we have this, uh, this, this, this civilizational excess we can nearly say people sometimes people say we're over socialized or something like that. We have a civilizational excess in which um, the 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 cooperative, agreeable tendencies, which are a part of human nature, just as much I would say anyway, just as much as the more affirmative, aggressive, assertive tendency inclinations within human within human psychology. Um, the tolerance side is definitely taken over at least like, I'm not saying that it's, you know, it's always hypocritical. You can always look, I know like, you know, you can look at uh, fake middle-class tolerance and, Oh, look, uh, they're being hypocrites because actually in, in this area or in that area, they're not so tolerant, et cetera, et cetera. All this is very true. And people should point out these hypocrisies, but even when, even when we point out these hypocrisies, um, it, 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 you know, it's, it's, and, and like, this is one of the problems of, of like, at least the sort of liberal Marxism that, that became dominant. Um, I don't think it's so much a problem with like the Soviet form of Marxism, but at least the Western liberal form of Marxism, you know, so you have this claim, oh, like tolerance and, uh, equality bourgeois blah 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 but it's not universal it's the it's the, there's a distinction between the bourgeois and the proletariat well yeah this is all true but 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 it sort of implies within its critique that the, the, the goal of civilization is universal universal niceness <laughs> you know what i mean universal niceness universal tolerance universal good manners universal equality universal blah 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 and I think that what we're having, to, we're going to have to learn within the 21st century, is that fundamentally this is not the goal of civilization. This is this is not this is just an excessive element of civilization, which has imposed itself hypocritically, sometimes violently, and forcefully, on other let's say principles of human nature, principles of human social um, interaction. And this is why you have this funny situation of having basically Jordan Peterson, who, who's who's in a who's in a uh, assertion trainer, becoming so popular because he's basically trying to remedy the very excess of. Well, I'm not saying he's consciously trying to do this, but his popularity implies that there's a that there's now a need to try remedy the excess of of tolerance, basically of this. Uh, of 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 that side of the agreeable, tolerant, cooperative side of uh, human nature. Okay, so you know where does the breakdown of rule of law really come from then? Because I agree that I agree with uh, anyone who says this that there has been a breakdown of 
process and of rule of law and so on and so on. Um, a, a liberal perspective might be inclined to say that this comes either from, you know, the fringes, this comes from Marxists, this comes from fascists, this comes from Russian interference, blah, 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 blah. Um, but actually it comes from this excess of tolerance itself because in order to have rule of law, you need some sort of, you, you need the more Apollonian uh, inclinations to uh, be present. You need, in order to have this conviction to process, in order to have a conviction to, to, um, to, to uh, s s sort of ethical, social standards, codes of conduct, um, you need the Apollonian, orderly, um, uh, assertive, uh, somewhat more masculine, we could say, um, if you wanted to, you know, put a kind of gendered mapping onto these as well. Um, these these um, psychopolitical principles need to be present in a society for a rule of law process to work, and they're not any anymore. Like they're like they're really not, and. There's a few explanations for why they're not. I mean, you can have the destruction of gender roles is probably one. You can have um, the excessive liberation of self-interest through capitalism. That's another one. Um, you could have. Um, uh, I'm not sure. There's all sorts of there's all sorts of uh, explanations for the for the destruction of the Apollonian. We could say, um, but one of the most fundamental ones is ironically enough coming from coming from medicine and psychiatry itself. Uh, medicine and psychiatry are, are at this point, I would argue, and this is, a, this is not something people have caught on to yet. I don't know why I'm, I'm early on this, but uh, we'll see in five years, maybe everyone will be thinking this way. Um, medicine and psychiatry is, is basically institutionally now uh, a priestly class whose role it is, is to indulge. And what they're indulging is basically distance from the Apollonian. So um, I don't know if you've seen The Dark Knight, um, not Dark Knight, the one before The Dark Knight, Batman Begins, where um, uh, a Scarecrow is a psychiatrist, you know, the, the guy that Killian, um, oh God, he's Irish and I can't remember his fucking name. This is terrible. Uh, the guy, you know, the guy who plays Scarecrow. He... Um, 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 he, 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 um, uh, acts as this kind of corrupt, um, psychiatrist who is working for the mob and his role is basically to argue madness, constantly argue madness to, to the judges in order to alleviate basically accountability and justice being pushed on the mob. Hence the reason you need a Batman because if the justice system was working, you wouldn't need a Batman. Batman is simply is simply an Apollonian, like a repressed Apollonian impulse, bursting into life through this insane-looking character who wears his bat costume and like runs around and like military-grade like high-tech equipment, you know, fighting people. Like it's it's the whole the whole franchise is actually ridiculous if you think about it, if you think about it on this kind of rational level, but but it works because it's a because 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 it because it it. It, it just like Peterson's, um, uh, uh, just like the, the most the most popular psychologist of our time being a, a um, assertiveness trainer, the Apollonian is just is just is just returning in these funny ways because it can't get a grip within the actual so, uh, social structures, the kind of formal social structures. So it so it it, it ends up. Um, it ends up acting in different ways. But anyway, the point I'm trying to make is that um, that uh, that uh, we now have structures which are designed entirely to alleviate people from any social standards, from any ethical standards, any political standards, um, uh, to participate through a victimology um, simply means, and this is not the victimology of, you know, like people that are in, actual poverty or something this is this is a this is a middle class victimology um uh to create distance uh, the indulgence is designed to create distance from from the apollonian um not only because 
you know, uh, it props up a kind of expert class or a priestly class, and it creates a kind of politicized, quasi-politicized uh, victim class, which, which, in, in which there's a dynamic of loyalty, uh, political loyalty, um, but also because um, it, it, it doesn't just distance the apple, like some individual who's claiming they have anxiety so they can't sit an exam or they're claiming that they have no sort of moral compass because they're crazy or something, um, or claiming this, and this this eventually got moved out into kind of all these postmodern categories, uh, feminism, um, LGBT, um, uh, post-colonial, blah, blah, blah. Um, these sorts of like victim groups are not like... The goal isn't to protect them necessarily. The goal is to is is, is to keep the ap the Apollonian um, s away, <laughs> keep it away, keep it away from society. Which is why it returns in the form of a bat or something like this, or in the form of a pop psychologist. Um, it, it, our society is so geared towards keeping the Apollonian away that that it's returning in these weird ways, and that's that's basically, in my opinion, the goal. And liberalism is just now nothing more than an Apollonian um, averter. It wants nothing to do with the Apollonian. It wants nothing to do with that, um, with that uh, uh, sort of sort of conviction towards a, a concept of justice, a sort of visceral conviction towards a concept of justice. It wants to keep that far away. Um, I was reminded recently of. Uh, 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 what we might call extreme expressions of conviction um which sometimes happen either during intense military um affairs or maybe on kind of voyages to faraway lands which happened you know before the world was circumnavigated and and uh you know everything became civilized and, and mapped out so for example um just speaking from an irish perspective we are shown this film in school uh, with, again, the, the fucking guy from Batman, Killian, is it Killian Murphy? Yeah, Kill Killian Murphy, yeah. Um, uh, playing an Irish revolutionary contingent uh, back in the War of Independence in 1916 and so on. And the film is basically, yeah, it's, it's basically about kind of Irish, Irish revolutionary uh, activities, trying to get independence from the British. And um, it's interesting because, like, the film is—it's quite clear even within a, within within a, within the direction of the film that they have this scene where um, uh, the the leaders of the revolution executed a few of their own men because their own men ended up giving information over to the British. And it was this horrible scene because they were very close to these young men. These young men were were like their brothers or their. You know, they were like from their hometowns and they treated they treated them like they were their brothers or their cousins or something. And it's 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 deliberately put in the film as this sort of like as this sort of um, maybe like a foil um, uh, to 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 imply uh, that, yes, we're happy that this um um we have independence and we're happy that this worked out for us at least if you're an irish person but don't ever think about anything like this ever again because if you do you're gonna have to kill your brother this is the this is the sort of like implicit conservative uh, not conservative in like whatever is in real sense but like the kind of uh, uh the way zizek would use the word conservative <laughs> um there's a there's an implicit ideological uh, message there and it's funny because I've had conversations with people just in the past about, for example, like Che Guevara and Fidel Castro, to use another kind of revolutionary example, um, where where they also executed some of their own men for similar reasons. And this is always brought up as this kind of caveat to like, yes, their cause was true, but, but did you know that they killed their own men? Did you know? And so on. Now, like, I'm not saying that this is like that, that whether or not if you are in this situation that the answer is obvious. I'm just saying that like, it's funny you have these people who probably never even have been involved in like 
a physical confrontation or have never been arrested before. Um, uh, applying abstract criticisms towards people that are in historical situations that we know nothing about. Maybe we know factually about to some degree, but we don't know like phenomenologically what it was like to be in those situations. But anyway, the, the, the point is, is that like there's this funny morality that we now have towards history, which is that, yes, we're glad the things happened the way they did. If, for example, you're Cuban and or you're like a socialist and you're talking about Che Guevara or if you're Irish and you're talking about uh, um, talking about um, Ireland, for example, but but like the sort of character of the people that could get us to where we are now, those people are crazy. Those people are evil and crazy. And fundamentally, liberal societies think this. Now, they don't just think this because they're stupid. They think this because they've, they've built a historical understanding. This is really getting complicated now, but bear with me. They've built an historical understanding of themselves as superior to people of the past and superior to people that are, for example, of a, of a lower socioeconomic class to them or people in other parts of the world based on the fact that they're unwilling to do the things which their ancestors were willing to do in order to get them into, into the situation that they're in today. It's very paradoxical. Um, uh, um, if, for example, if you read about the, the, the um, explorers who discovered, you know, circumnavigated the, the, the world and explored America and so on, uh, founded America, Columbus, and some of these other Portuguese explorers and so on and so forth. These men were like constantly under the threat of mutiny because they were going so far and like people, their, their crew were sort of anxious and scared. They wanted to go home. And there was often the threat of mutiny and there was even mutiny attempts in certain situations. And the leaders of these voyages had to execute the mutineers. We live in a world which was built by people that were willing to do things which we would be so offended by today. And it's, it's, it, it's, it's this, sort of, this sort of contradiction, to use Marx, the kind of Marxian term, this contradiction is built on the fact that we've created a self-consciousness of tolerance, of excessive, of excessive agreement, tolerance, so on and so forth. In that, in that there's a social currency built around it. We are superior, more progressive, more enlightened, of a, of a better, of a superior socioeconomic class, uh, more civilized, uh, based on the fact that we have this excessive tolerance, which would, which would cripple us in situations like the ones I've just named. Ultimately, what this implies is we are more we are more civilized because we have less conviction this this is basically this is basically the the fundamental definition of um our time and my question is basically how can a how can a society that that has a self consciousness in which it distinguishes itself from the past from other people's from it has a kind of class structure, a kind of character of the upper middle class and the elites in which, in which a lack of conviction, and that also means a lack of conviction towards what? Well, towards, towards a rule of law, towards a, towards a vision or towards a, towards a, um, 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 uh, conception of justice and a conception of what's right and wrong. Um, without a conviction towards that, how can the society provide a rule of provide rule of law? Now you might say, because there's certain kind of bureaucratic processes and constitutional frameworks and blah 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 blah. blah. Um, well, I don't know. Like, <laughs> I'm thinking of a recent example when all of our usual processes were all. Um, I'm, I'm speaking of COVID here, um, where all of the processes uh, were all abandoned um, so easily just because there was a virus which had an average death rate of like people who were 84 um, emerged and this became the fashionable, uh, uh, this became the current thing for two years. Um, you know, so so like 
uh, I'm not, you know, during that time you had judges casting down sentences on people's life sentences or not providing sentences, which should be provided, basically making decisions over justice um, from Zoom. And they were probably wearing their pajamas underneath their fancy velvet uh, cloaks or whatever they were supposed to wear. Um, there, it, it, it again, it it all comes back to this fundamental loss of the Apollonian. Now, I'm not that does that doesn't mean that there isn't like rigid bureaucratic systems. There isn't rigid processes. There isn't rigid decision making and so on. And it doesn't mean that there's no that there's no structure or like rules to a society. When we're talking about the Apollonian conviction, which which is implied when Fukuyama says rule of law, like a, a, a liberal society is better because it, it sticks to a rule of law. You're not talking about simple bureaucratic processes. Um, uh, uh, you can totally have processes which are geared towards averting the rule of law. I'm thinking here of like some of Zizek's anecdotes about uh, processes in uh, ex, ex-Soviet parts of um, Eastern Europe and so on, um, where he claims that the, the, the most offensive thing you could do was actually to believe in in uh, uh, real socialism. Um, you can have these kind of comical inversions and 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 of of a conviction towards a um, a kind of civilizational ideal or a civilizational conception of justice. You, you can have these comical inversions, but these comical inversions don't look like what, you know, someone like Thomas Hobbes thought they would look like, which is, which is, um, you know, pagan warlords running around, stabbing each other in their sleep or something, stabbing each other when, you know, murdering children in their cots. This isn't, this isn't actually how this always plays out. Um, a breakdown of a fundamental uh, 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 conception of justice, which means a psychopolitical loss of a conviction towards a sense of justice, is often plays out in much more bureaucratic um, um, and seemingly civilized ways. And I would say that, like, I'm not trying to make a simple comparison between the late Soviet Union and contemporary liberal society, but there is somewhat of a comparison there insofar as that it has this sense, it has this appearance of order and bureaucracy and process and scientific hygienic so-called order. But this so-called order is fundamentally lacking. Uh, 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 what is in whatever the thing is, which is implied in the term rule of law, which Fukuyama uses.